From the nation's capital, Washington debates for the 70s, a series of programs designed to bring together for an open exchange of views and opinions, outstanding authorities on vital issues facing the world of the 70s. The topic, what price defense? How are we going to manage the impact of inflation on defense spending? Are our weapons becoming too complicated and costly? Can we safely cut our overseas defense forces? Now, here is Peter Haggis. In the early days of the Republic, just after the Revolution, it cost the new country less than three quarters of a million dollars to support its military establishment. For example, the bill came to $644,000 in fiscal 1790. For fiscal 1975, we may spend more than $90 billion on America's military might. In today's world, how much is enough? Should we be paying more attention to domestic priorities? How can we manage the impact of inflation on military spending? Is American citizen support for a large defense establishment declining? Well, these are just a few of the questions that need intelligent answers if wise decisions are to be made. Welcome to another in a series of rational debate seminars presented by the American Enterprise Institute, a nonpartisan, nonprofit research and education organization. Our subject is What Price Defense? A topic that leads naturally to other questions. Are American foreign commitments less demanding now since our withdrawal from Vietnam? Are modern weapons becoming too complicated and just too costly? Can we safely cut back our overseas forces? What effect, if any, is the U.S.-Soviet detente having on the military threat to the United States? Our debaters today are Democratic Senator Edmund Muskie of Maine, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee since 1971 and chairman of its Arms Control Subcommittee, and Republican Senator Bill Brock of Tennessee, a member of the Senate Government Operations Committee whose major interest has been in restructuring the nation's budget-making processes. Also with us today here at the American Enterprise Institute are many other experts in the field of military affairs and defense spending, men and women engaged in making public policy, in teaching, and in writing on the subject, What Price Defense? Later in the program, they'll be asked to comment, and they'll question our debaters. Now, to present our discussion, a veteran Washington correspondent with the Public Broadcasting Service, Paul Duke. The debate we present tonight is representative of a larger debate which has been building up now for several years on Capitol Hill. There was a time when the Pentagon almost always had its way, and its budget request rolled through Congress with practically no opposition. But all of this has changed as more members have challenged the amount being spent for military purposes. This year, the Pentagon is asking for almost $86 billion, a record request. Defense Secretary Schlesinger and his defenders say all of this is essential to counter a continuing Russian buildup. Critics say the request should be cut back by five to $10 billion. Senator Muskie favors major reductions. Senator Brock opposes major reductions. We'll have the first statement now from Senator Muskie. Thank you. I'd uh, like to emphasize at the outset that the issue before us is not whether America should be strong or weak. Like most Americans, I favor a strong national defense. And like most Americans, I believe that the United States cannot afford to follow an isolationist policy in today's world. Nor can we allow the Soviet Union or any other power to achieve strategic superiority over us. And so these are not the issues. But rather, as Mr. Duke has put it, the issue is whether the Congress can make any significant reductions in the administration's defense budget for fiscal year 1975. A spending request in terms of budget authority is against outlays as represented by Mr. Duke's figure, a spending request of $92.6 billion. 
without undermining our security interests or our foreign policy objectives. I am prepared to argue that it can. Congress has the responsibility to make spending decisions which reflect the needs of our people. The nation's security is certainly a high priority need. There are others, health, transportation, education, environmental improvement, law enforcement, to name just a few. Federal funding for education is now only seven and a half billion dollars. Funding for drug abuse enforcement and prevention is only $750 million. For community development and housing, only $6.4 billion. For pollution control, only $700 million. For energy research, only $2 billion. Compare these figures to the defense budget of almost $93 billion. That $93 billion request represents a $10 billion increase over the last fiscal year. A $10 billion increase, notwithstanding the fact that we have withdrawn from Vietnam, the costliest war in our history, notwithstanding the fact that we have an arms control agreement with the Soviet Union, and that we have entered into a new era of negotiation, and notwithstanding the fact that the Nixon Doctrine calls for a much less interventionist foreign policy than we have had in the past. Only two days ago, President Nixon sent to the Congress a message accompanying the report of his Council of Economic Advisors, in which he said this, too much government spending is the spark that most often sets off inflationary explosions. We must work together to cut where we safely can. We must so discipline our present decisions that they do not commit us to excessive spending in the future. What I propose is that we apply the President's tests to the defense budget. Nobody wants to shortchange the defense effort, but the unavoidable fact is that our nation has other needs besides military power. Our total resources are always limited and must be allocated among many competing needs in our society. In this sense, all nations must compromise on national defense. History shows that they do, as we have, even in wartime. I would also like to point out that Secretary of Defense Schlesinger stated last February before the House Defense Appropriations Subcommittee that outlays for defense might have been a billion or a billion and a half dollars less in 1975 were it not for the fact that additional spending was deemed necessary to stimulate the economy. The st Secretary has since tried to explain away that statement, I'm not sure he succeeded. But I'd like, like to make the point that I do not believe that increased defense spending, which isn't justified by our security needs, is the wisest fiscal tool for stimulating our economy. Turning to the specifics of the defense budget, the format of this debate will not permit a detailed analysis of the defense budget are a systematic presentation of budget alternatives. There are a number of public policy organizations which have done excellent work in this field, and their proposed cuts range as high as $15 billion. I believe that reductions in the range of 5 to $10 billion are not unreasonable and certainly not unsafe. Let me give some specific examples, which we can perhaps expand upon in the question period later. First, in the area of manpower costs, which amount to over 55% of the total defense budget, 
The Senate Armed Services Committee has already recommended a 2% cut in military manpower and a 4% cut in the civilian bureaucracy of the Defense Department this year. I would recommend additional manpower cuts beyond this, emphasizing reductions in support troops and civilian bureaucrats, saving our taxpayers well over $2 billion in payroll and attendant operation and maintenance costs. Secondly, in the area of conventional weapon systems for our general purpose forces, here, defense planners have gradually moved toward what is called a high-low mix. Certain very expensive, maximum capability weapon systems complemented by less expensive and less capable alternatives. I welcome the trend toward less expensive alternatives at the lower end of the mix. Past procurement trends have been too spendthrift, favoring new weapon systems equipped with all the most advanced technologies, regardless of expense, even when gains in performance were marginal. Substantial savings, ranging from $1 to $4 billion, could be realized by stretching out procurement of more expensive weapon systems at the higher end of the mix, or substituting for them altogether, and by emphasizing the lower end of the mix wherever possible. Third, I believe that cuts can be made in the budget for strategic weapon systems. I recognize that strategic forces account for only 20% of the United States defense budget. But we are engaged in negotiations with the Soviet Union, designed to stabilize and hopefully to achieve reductions in strategic nuclear weapon systems. We need not accelerate our own weapons development at this time on the theory that this would strengthen our position at the negotiating table. Now, I might emphasize that this involves the question which the President posed, that we ought not to make decisions today which can result in excessive spending down the road. And finally, there is the administration's request for military assistance funds for foreign countries, amounting to nearly $3 billion. I believe that at least $1 billion can be cut from that figure with more than half coming out of the administration's $1.45 billion request for Vietnam. It is time that we ask tough questions concerning the relationship between all military assistance and our real foreign policy objectives. This, then, is a brief review of some of the issues in the defense budget. I'm sure that Senator Brock and those of you in the audience will give us ample opportunity to expand upon the points that I have raised and to get down to specifics. And I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you, Senator Muskie. We'll hear at this time from Senator Brock. Thank you very much. I think both of us probably approach this debate with a certain amount of concern because the question of what price defense is one that's almost classic and probably can't be answered, certainly not to everyone's satisfaction. You might as well ask what constitutes deterrence or what are the national goals of this country of ours. We've never definitively answered the question of what price deterrence, but we do know when deterrence ends, when it fails. Question of Defense is similar. We do know that uh, spending too much on defense can jeopardize this country or any country. But we also know that not spending enough on defense can see a more tragic result. I think the premise of, our, of my own approach to the matter should be simply 
that nuclear war must be deterred because it's a war that can't be won. The question then is, how do we determine our defense budget? Do domestic priorities or foreign threats and international necessities take precedence? Is it really an either-or question? I'm not sure that it is, and I, I think there's one way that we might begin the, the debate, at least in looking at the problem, and that's to compare the price of defense, first with our domestic priorities, with its burden on the economy and a burden on the, the tax dollar, and secondly, to relate it to foreign threats and international necessities in terms of our role as the leader and the only true defender of the free world. Let me start by comparing defense to the domestic budget. Nobody, I don't think, would contend that military spending is not high and probably not going to get even higher. There are a number of reasons for this. Our increased, enormously increased personnel costs caused by the volunteer army, the increased sophistication of our weaponry and our double-digit inflation, among other things, have a, a great deal to do with it. It will continue to be expensive. But I might point out that in terms of, of the budget, our manpower is down, as is its share of the gross national product, as is the share of the federal budget, to the lowest point in this nation's uh, last 30 years since before the Korean War. We're down to 28 percent of the unified budget. We're down to 6 percent of the gross national product. I think it's important to note that not only has there been an enormous shift in the defense budget, but it's been accompanied by a reversed change in our domestic priorities budget. Defense from 1968 to 1975 increased 9%. Our expenditures for health increased 174%. For education and manpower, 71%. For income security, 193%. Even our legislative functions, uh, I would say to my colleague in the Senate, have increased 161%, almost 20 times as much as our defense budget. Thus, by three important measures, our defense spending has decreased significantly, while concurrently spending for domestic priorities has increased even more. Those three areas are as a percent of gross national product, as a percent of federal budget outlays, and in const constant dollars. I think the important thing, whether you use administration or, or critics data, and there are differing approaches to these figures, is that there is a definite, discernible downtrend in defense spending vis-a-vis -vis domestic spending. And that's the crucial point. Now, this does not mean that 5.9% of the gross national product might not still be too high, especially when you realize that we're talking an obligational authority of $92 billion. So let's look then at the other part of the comparison, that is vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union or any potential threat. In the Soviet Union, we have seen an enormously disturbing trend, at least to me, of, of massive investment in research and development, in hardware and technology, and particularly in strategic capability. The Russians are developing not only new and larger weapons with greater throw weight, the SS-16, 17, 18, and 19, but they're doing it in a more sophisticated way with onboard uh, capability, directional capability with MIRVs and so forth. They've increased their strength in Eastern Europe. They've added enormously to uh, their tank capabilities there and their logistics capabilities, an area in which they were weak. They have increased their Navy by a uh, remarkable degree, and not just in their submarine capacity. In some, I think, in terms of our relative strength with the Soviet Union, there are areas of serious concern. When you couple that concern with the first comparison, that of a declining share of our product and productivity, I think it's fair to conclude that while the defense budget is not 
an intolerable burden on the American people, neither is it, is it our most efficient expenditure. And I think here's where we might find some areas of, of agreement. I very much uh, support the high-low concept, which the Pentagon is already beginning to implement, maybe later than, necessary, than it should have, but it's doing it. I'd also like to see us uh, adopt a phase-in, phase-out of, of new and old programs, and by that I mean a, uh, an effort to try not to develop three new major component parts of Triad all in the same fiscal year, which uh, burdens the American people, I think, unnecessarily. Third, I'd like to proceed very much more on a program of capability without production, which simply means proceeding with research and development, but not production until strategic necessity dictates. And fourth, I'd like very much to see a, a much better definition of roles for our armed services, and I would cite as an illustration the uh, request for a Marine for uh, Marine Corps F-14 so that they could get to the beach. And I don't think that's the responsibility of the Marine Corps. As a Navy man, maybe I'm biased, but I think that's the Navy's responsibility. But I do think they need the capability of ground support when there. I guess what I'd like to debate or talk about is, in, in conclusion, is not whether we should spend uh, X number of dollars on the B-1 or Trident or even Diego Garcia, but the more fundamental question of what the role of this country is and should be. Can we really afford to go into what may become, at least in interpretation on the part of our neighbors in the world, uh, a retreat into isolation? And I'm afraid that's how a major uh, reduction would be interpreted. It'd be easy and it would save us an awful lot of money. We wouldn't need very much more than a few Polaris and uh, Minutemen, but I think we have an obligation to maintain our leadership in a pluralistic world with freedom of movement, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. And if we do, that requires a, a maintenance of our military uh, strength. I believe in and I support detente, as I'm sure almost all do, but I'd hope we're not deluded by what it means. To us it means, as Henry Kissinger said this year, our view about detente is produced by the horrors that a nuclear war would inflict on mankind, and therefore the obligation is imposed on the leaders of all the countries to do their utmost to present, prevent such a catastrophe from arising. I think all of us support that. But there may be confusion in the minds of many that detente means the basic underlying philosophical questions between this country and others have gone away. That all of a sudden we don't have to worry so much that we can uh, believe the Soviet leadership uh, and believe that maybe their successors are going to be as interested in peace. And yet, you read Pravda and they, and they make some interesting comments. They say, uh, the Western insistence on intellectual freedom is a cloak for, so, uh, for subtle anti-Soviet propaganda. It follows from this that there can be no talk of ideological co coexistence or even ideological armistice. I think it's important that we remember that attitude. And as we look at the defense budget, there have been excesses. There have been gross errors of management, miscalculation. But that fact does not, and I'm quoting Matthew Taylor here, and I think it's, I'd like to quote him exactly, that unhappy fact does not diminish one whit the very real need to protect those things which we consider indispensable to our survival, power, or well-being, and hence deserving the expenditure of effort and resources to gain, retain, or enjoy. And I think that's, in essence, the price of defense. Thank you, Senator Brock. Our topic tonight is the defense budget and how big that budget should be. And now we'll have brief rebuttals. First, Senator Muskie. I'd like to make <clears throat> two points immediately. First, in my judgment, and I gather this is Senator Brock's, the detente does not eliminate the need for strong defense. Detente, as I view it, is simply a recognition of the fact by the two super nuclear powers uh, that uh, 
unless they are willing to move on the road to mutual destruction, that they must find a way to reduce the possibilities of nuclear confrontation. That's all that the target is. So we need uh, a strong defense. Secondly, I don't buy the idea that any reduction in, a defense, uh, in the defense budget represents a retreat into isolation. Uh, Senator Brock uh, suggested that, uh, that uh, cuts in defense uh, could be so interpreted by our friends, uh, by our potential enemies, and so on. But I'd like to point out that uh, there have been significant declines in defense budgets before, following the Korean War, for example. And the decline since the peak Vietnam War years as a percentage of the federal budget and as a percentage of gross national product was not as steep as they were in uh, following previous wars. But I'd also like to make this point. I don't think there's any reason for us to guarantee to the Department of Defense a fixed percentage of gross national product or a fixed percentage of our federal budget. There's no connection between the two. And gross national product is a measure of the productivity of the economy. And a particular share of the rest of the federal budget is unjustified when we consider that the federal budget is a measure of our domestic public needs. As the country's production and population grow, most domestic government programs must grow too. A larger economy with more people needs more schools, more roads, more social security payments, even more tax collectors. But growth in the economy and population do not themselves require proportionately additional defense spending in order to protect America's interests. And I emphasize this point because the argument made by Senator Brock is often made by our generals and admirals. They say you ought to guarantee us you know, a certain fixed percentage of GNP. In my judgment, defense needs should instead be determined by our long-range international interests and our best judgment of how military power can or may be forced to serve them. I don't know how much additional time I have on my rebuttal, but I'd like to make this third point, if I may. The implication is here that one of the reasons for the expanding defense budget is to, to, to meet the acceleration of Soviet development in the strategic arms field. Let me give you just a few statistics to document this point. Since 1970, the United States has produced 758 additional missiles compared to 492 by the Soviet Union and 4,850 nuclear weapons compared to 572 on the part of the Soviet Union. In the last four years, while our military people concentrate on the development of Soviet strategic nuclear capability. They tended uh, to overlook the progress that we ourselves have been making. Now, these particular figures that I've given you can be matched by more detail, which I'll be glad to go into in the question period that follows. But I simply don't buy the notion that because there has been forward movement in the development of Soviet strategic nuclear capability, that there must be additional increments of American effort on top of the effort we've already made in recent years to match it. I think these are two issues that will probably emerge in the course of this debate as points of real difference between Senator Brock and myself. And now we'll have the rebuttal from Senator Brock. Not quite sure where to start, um, but let me take almost, I guess, the last point first. Uh, I have no intention of uh, suggesting that a, a percentage of gross national product or of the federal budget should be allocated uh, in perpetuity to uh, any arm of government, defense or otherwise. I, I am not so concerned about 
uh, shares of the budget as I am uh, the peace of this nation and its security. And that's a more difficult area to judge. I simply point out that since Vietnam, since the end of Vietnam, we have cut defense by in 1975 dollars or in constant dollars, whether you want to use 68 or 75, in excess of 25 billion dollars. We've also reduced its share, its strain on the economy uh, from 42 percent to 27 percent. We've cut its share of the gross national product from 9 percent to less than 6. Now, those are pretty healthy cuts. Let's take it back to a pre-Vietnam year. Let's go to 1964. We've cut it from 8.3 percent down to 6 percent of the gross national product, 41 percent of the budget down to 27 percent. Any way you cut it, we have reduced significantly. The question is not uh, what's the share, but whether or not uh, it's proposed cuts of the magnitude that the Senator is talking about will in fact uh, reduce our capability for defense, reduce our capability for deterrence. That's the question. Nothing else really matters very much to people whose children uh, may be jeopardized. And that's the issue I think we've got to debate. It just isn't right, and I cannot accept uh, the merging of apples and oranges here, the measurement of of U.S. missile production of very small uh, missiles against the uh, the developments of the SS-19, for example, which has a capability which we don't even approach in any program we have on the books or in even in, in the future under any projection I have ever seen. And it doesn't change the fact, and I will uh, quote here the, the Brookings study, the strategic balance taking everything into account, now there is probably rough overall strategic parity, but these, and I will say parenthetically, uh, these things don't happen overnight. Once this, and this is quoting, once the Soviets master the techniques necessary to obtain accuracies closer to those even now available to the United States, they would be likely soon to acquire a capacity to destroy virtually all the U.S. land-based missiles in a first strike, and that to me constitutes a very real and present danger and it is something that I found unacceptable. Thank you, gentlemen. The many questions that surround an adequate military budget defy unified answers. Senator Muskie feels there are so many other important claims to each tax dollar that there must be a realignment of spending priorities. Senator Brock says that the country should spend whatever is necessary. To challenge both our speakers, let's go now to our panel of experts for their questions. Senator Gottlieb, Executive Director of SANE. A question for Senator Brock. The uh, latest uh, Defense Department uh, annual report shows that the uh, United States is about to have almost 8,000 uh, nuclear warheads in the Soviet Union, about 2,600 by mid-1974. Uh, that means we will have about 36 H-bombs for every major Soviet city. My question is, uh, when do you think enough is enough? I don't know that uh, there is any uh, definitive answer for that. I would point out two things. First of all, uh, the Soviet MIRV capacity has just been refined and developed, and it is now uh, coming online. That means that that balance is going to change markedly in the next five to ten years which I consider to be years of great risk for this country. To me, the, one of the things that we really ought to be debating tonight and every other night for, or every other day for a long time, is what gets us into a position that might force the use of such a weapon. One of the things that worries me most about the suggested cuts, uh, particularly in conventional forces, when you make cuts of the magnitude that have been proposed by some uh, in our conventional structure, armed services, uh, defense personnel, and so forth, you run, I think, the rather clear risk of forcing this nation to an early 
reliance on nuclear weapons. That's just something I don't ever want to see happen. And I, uh, I'm not for a, a, an explosion in terms of, of numbers. We're not building any new Minutemen 3. We, uh, we are refining our undersea weapons, but uh, not so much in terms of quantity as we are in terms of quality and survivability, which is a pure deterrent. It is, uh, it is not designed for uh, first strike capability. We have never sought that in our undersea weapons, and I don't think uh, we would want to. The point is that uh, as we are proceeding today, if we <coughs> limit our conventional capability, we then force this nation into a posture of reliance on the one weapon none, none of us want to use, and that's the thing I cannot accept. A uh, question right back here. In the I'm Amram Katz from the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. This question is addressed to Senator Muskie, but I would hope that Senator Brock would comment on it as well. I realize we're dealing with extremely hard and difficult questions here, which are fraught with much uncertainty. No matter how definitely answers are given, there's still residual uncertainty. When I was young and problems were simple, or maybe it was the other way around, I was simple and problems were young, I was much more confident about answers to all these questions than I am today. Uh, I don't really know how we know that we're spending too much. I'm reminded, Senator Muskie, of uh, Dayton, Ohio, which built five dams around it to, after World War I. <coughs> It's like saying, let's get rid of the dams because we haven't had a flood since. There's cause and effect relationship. The question I have, therefore, is do unilateral cuts during the time of negotiations help or hinder negotiations with our adversary? And for principally, do they help or hinder advancement toward the object of the exercise, which is international stability and peace and so forth? Well, my own view of that is that uh, we're each aware of the other's capability for mounting uh, uh, military power. And, you know, I'd find it very discouraging if I had to believe that the only way to move toward arms control and arms agreement is to convert the potential military power that each country has to its maximum in reality. And that's the logical extension of the argument of the bargaining chip. I mean, if one bargaining chip, uh, you know, is this an incentive for the other side to achieve a certain level of arms control, maybe two bargaining chips <coughs> persuade them to achieve another level, and three bargaining chips even more. It seems to me that uh, the United States and its uh, forces in being and its programs uh, which are underway has demonstrated an ability uh, to build a strategic uh, capacity uh, which uh, poses an unacceptable threat to the Soviet Union. And that it is in the light of that understanding and of our understanding of their capacity to do likewise that we've been moved to sit down together to negotiate meaningful arms agreements. I had this kind of a discussion with Mr. Kasigian in, in Moscow two years ago. Now, we're not going to we're not going to reach agreements of this kind unless we each see it is in our national interest to do so. And I simply do not believe, you know, that the amount of money we may happen to be spending on a particular weapon system in a particular fiscal year uh, and an increase in that amount in that particular fiscal year is going to be the final determinant as to whether or not we're going to negotiate an agreement. I just, just don't buy that kind of an argument. Now, it's, uh, there's another point that I would make, you know, that I think the reverse could be true, that as we build up our arms as bargaining chips, the other side doesn't really know whether or not we're simply picking up, uh, building up a, a bargaining ploy or have serious intentions of maintaining that kind of a capability. I would think they'd have to assume that we seriously mean to maintain that kind of escalated uh, capability and that they must do likewise. So it seems to me the incentive is in the other direction. And, and, and I think the, the experience with MERV is a clear example of this. 
I can remember that when we finally completed our MERV tests, and I had urged before they were completed that we suspend tests so that there'd be some chance that we could negotiate uh, perhaps an agreement which would, uh, which would avoid moving into the MERV era. But when we, once we completed the MERV tests, we were inevitably moved and pressured into deploying MERVs. Once we had done that, we knew that we had to let the Russians <coughs> move into the MERV capability, and that's exactly where we are. And so the result of our failure to exercise restraint with respect to MERV testing and deployment resulted in an escalation of the arms race on the very eve of an agreement to enter the SALT talks. And now I doubt that we, I know that we can't back off from MERV. I don't see any indication that we will. And the Russians won't if we won't. Senator Brock, do you want to give us your views? I sure do. I, uh, I, I, I don't think that's the question. The question is, is it wise, is it good policy, does it yield any productive dividend for us to engage in unilateral cuts when we're in the middle of negotiations? Now that is, is something that you've got to answer in a very different way. We're not talking bargaining chips of building something new. We're talking, do we engage in unilateral cuts of our own defense when we're engaged in negotiation in SALT II? If the purpose of SALT on the part of this country is to get Russia to reduce their missile capability, then I think it's fair to assume that the purpose of SALT for them is to get us to reduce our missile capability, our strategic arms. If we're going to reduce our capability without going to the bargaining table, why go? The whole purpose of negotiation is to negotiate a balanced reduction. So unilateral cuts of a major consequence in the defense budget make negotiation fruitless and perhaps not even possible. That's the basic question you've got to face. The fact is that the Soviet Union has never, not once in my entire life, unilaterally reduced its defense expenditures, either as a result of our actions or something else, as far as I know. They haven't demonstrated any willingness. They have continued to increase their level of expenditures, their, their research and development, their capability, and they're getting a much too dangerous capability today to, for us to back off from bargaining as best we can, as strongly as we can. Frank Vandalin, the National Banner. And Senator Muskie, you know that while we are at peace at the moment, we have a very dangerous situation in the Middle East, and there was a really hot war there just a few months ago. And we had to send uh, airlift large supplies of tanks and anti-tank weapons and ammo and everything else to Israel to keep Israel from being overcome by the Arab forces. I'd like to ask you, Senator, in case the war should resume in the Middle East and Israel should again ask us to send over our most modern tanks and the tow anti-tank missiles, would you favor sending them everything they need? I don't think it's helpful to answer a question like that in terms of uh, uh, the situation in the Middle East. You know, that, uh, if it, coming from a United States Senator, that takes the form of an ultimatum. Now, I've indicated... Are, sir, aren't we pledged to protect Israel? Though? And that pledge stands, but now yes. you want me to pose a hypothetical situation in which they fail to meet their pledges because they've agreed, both Syria and Egypt, to a withdrawal agreement now you're opposing a breach of that by somebody, Israel or the Arab nations or both, and ask me to anticipate what our reaction would be. I think that would be highly provocative. Well, sir, don't you believe that our military must be prepared for just that kind of eventuality? Oh, we well, that's, a, diff that's a different kind of exactly. a question. It has to be, of course, I believe to be ready for. We should be prepared, but you asked me to specify what kind of aid I'd be prepared to send. And I just don't believe it's helpful. No, but sir, consider a hypothetical kind of question. Sword rattling. Consider a hypothetical question that Charlie aside from There's whether. There's no such thing in this context. Oh, say. but there is, because every contingency no. plan is based upon something that may occur and may not occur. The question, sir, is would you send our tanks to Israel if they needed them? 
we are pledged, may I say, and I'll repeat it, I don't know if any better way to repeat it, to, to provide Israel with the arms necessary to maintain a military balance in the Middle East. And our next I question. consider that pledge still binding, and I'm sure that that's a responsible way to answer the question. Well, it, it, my question is serious, one, sir, because... Well, my answer the is... Yes, the question is, uh, that I would like to follow up here is, where would we get these tanks? Well, we have uh, an item in the budget for tanks. Sir, how many tanks do we produce a year in the United I States? I couldn't give you that figure. You should know, sir, the House Armed Services Committee reported last week our total production of tanks for the entire United States for the entire year is 360 tanks, which is a, which could be, which were easily destroyed in about one hour's warfare in the Middle East in October. Well, I take it that what you're arguing by implication is that we should raise our tank production every year. That's exactly what a, the Armed Services Committee proposed, sir. A well, you didn't of our let tank me production. finish my question. Yes. Yeah. You don't know what they proposed, that whether or not I agreed with the Armed Services Committee. What you seem to be proposing is that our tank production should be geared to the capacity of the Middle East countries to consume them in a repetition no, of sir. the war of last fall. And no, I don't, sir, I don't buy that conclusion. Would you buy them, sir, that we should have our tanks in production enough to meet our quotas so that our own armed forces in Europe would be up to combat efficient status, which they are not today? We have not had it recommended that we, we try have, to... Sir. Thank you, Could Senator I Muskie. I think we want to go to another panelist with another question. Right. Ruth Cluson, uh, League Women Voters, United States. I would address this to Senator Brock. It seems to me that we've been focusing on the negative factors which influence the building of a national defense budget. Uh, so essentially, Senator, I'd like to ask you where in the proposed defense budget is reflected the favorable things which have happened during the past couple of years, for instance, the cessation of fighting in Vietnam, the improved relations with China, the increased trade with USSR, uh, the, uh, at least for the time being, successful negotiations in the Middle East. The American public, I think, feels that has a right to expect to see these things affected, uh, affect the national defense budget as also. Uh, to what extent? Are they reflected in the proposal? Extensively. We, uh, we have cut in constant or real dollars, uh, effectively some $25 billion out of the defense budget. It would be that much higher were we maintaining the Vietnam uh, level. More to the point we are, are reducing not only the constant dollar, but we're also reducing the load on the American people in very specific terms. I might point out to you that there is another peace dividend that uh, I supported and still do, and that's called a volunteer army. But you and I as citizens have to pay for a little bit of freedom in this regard, and that volunteer army has uh, been enormously expensive to the extent of about uh, 20 or $21 billion over what we would have paid if we'd maintained the previous level. You see, what that does is that it puts a burden not only on our defense budget, but it also skews the ratio of spending over to personnel as opposed to research and development and, uh, and technology and even hardware if we get to that point, making it far more difficult for us to maintain an adequate strategic reserve or defense uh, in the in the term of the budget, or in the sense of maintaining a uh, stable budget, and yet we have been able to do so. We have been able to do so by reducing the number of people by over three million men in all defense and defense-related industries in the last five years uh, by uh, similar economies in, in other ways. So we are, I think, maintaining a pretty adequate defense. There's some areas where I criticize it, also where there are excesses. But we've gotten a rather major peace dividend in the last five years. It continues to be of great benefit to particularly our young people, with uh, not only in terms of taxes, but the volunteer army. Uh, Leslie Gell from the New York Times. I'm trying to think of what you gentlemen have been saying in terms of how it's being heard or will be heard by that famous uh, citizen in Peoria. And I would, I would guess that uh, 
in listening to it, he would find himself very confused. Here is Senator Brock asserting that uh, we have to worry about uh, Soviet nuclear missiles, and Senator Muskie saying it's uh, not so much of a worry, in fact, we're ahead of them. We have some Air Force generals saying we have to worry about Soviet uh, tactical air forces, and yet we have the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, having said that uh, our tactical air forces can kick the hell out of the Soviet tactical air forces. Uh, you have the Navy saying we have to worry about the Soviet shipbuilding program, and a report by the Brookings Institution saying we don't have to worry about it. How does he make up his mind? Can we narrow the debate in terms of something that is decidable? You, Senator Brock, said you are in favor of cuts in the defense budget. You can see areas for efficiency. Senator Muskie hinted at those, too. Could you specify what those might be and what they'd add up to in savings? I'm not sure I'm talking so much about cuts as I am shifts. For example, both of us have supported the high-low concept. That makes a lot of sense. I suggested at the outset uh, a phase-in of our strategic programs like Triad, not trying to do them all at the same time. I suggested that uh, uh, we do more uh, research and development without production. These are things that are specific line items where I think we can effectuate savings but I'm not so sure that I really think our research and development is adequate. Let me just turn it around on you and say that uh, I'm not sure we ought to be debating line items or even dollars. I think we ought to uh, try to decide uh, if there is a price to defense, what is it that we can bear and, yet, and have some assurance that we're protecting the security of this country. And, you know, anything else really is almost irrelevant. I can't make a decision between uh, weapon systems. I'm not qualified. I'm not sure that any of us are. I can say that whatever it takes, I think the people of my state are willing to pay a price to ensure that their children live in peace. That's the price. <clears throat> Do you have a response, Senator Musk? Well, with respect to the specific weapon systems, uh, I would agree with Senator Brock that uh, you can get differences of opinion that are not necessarily uh, determinative of your overall attitude toward uh, you know, how much you should spend. Uh, but uh, I can suggest some specific weapon systems that I think... Now, I was uh, talking about efficiency cuts apart from these weapon systems. Again, you can argue back and forth on each one of these weapon right, systems. That's right. I'd agree with that. And I was trying to get it to something that might be decidable or discernible. Where the, where the opinions don't vary as much as uh, you gentlemen have been expressing I this I do evening. think we would agree efficiency on efficiency cuts, cuts in, in a number of areas. It's the program cuts, the, the weapon item cuts. Well, that what we're efficiency have cuts would you agree on, Senator? Well, I, I thought I listed some uh, in terms of phasing uh, in But you were saying you cut in, in some areas, but you increase R&D, and the level remains the same. That's correct. So maybe I'm not cutting, maybe I'm just saying our R&D is not adequate in terms of what's going to happen by 1980. One last brief question. Again, I have the same concern as, my name's Ted Mann with LTV, and I have the same concern as the, our good friend of the New York Times about our people in Peoria listening. And I uh, have a question for Senator Muskie. Uh, uh, so that the man in Peoria can put things in perspective, don't you feel it would be fairer to uh, not keep talking about increased budgets when that really ignores the tremendous impact of inflation, which means it's obviously going to go up every year. And shouldn't we really be talking just about the procurement part of the budget with the entire 50 odd million dollars that now goes to pay for this wonderful volunteer army put aside? We're really looking at about a 35 billion dollar procurement hardware budget. And I don't think our friend in Peoria knows that. Well, my emphasis was uh, was different than that. I, uh, Fifty-five percent of the budget is manpower. Uh, I put a conservative figure of two billion dollars on the cuts that I think we could make there, uh, not cutting into combat effectiveness at all, cutting into uh, support uh, personnel, which is high, cutting into excessive uh, civilian personnel, which is high, and cutting into uh, ex uh, uh, to excessive grade creep, as it's called, that is, a too high a percentage of officers, non-commissioned officers, to uh, to men. Now, just in those categories, you can save at least $2 billion, and there are those who say you can save up to 5 in manpower. That's got nothing to do with procurement. 
I think that you can make cuts in strategic arms along the lines that I've suggested. Uh, the Secretary of Defense's new policy is to begin to, uh, to, to, to develop uh, accuracy and uh, uh, counterforce capability. I think that's destabilizing. I don't think it's necessary to the success of the SALT talks. It adds a mere 300 million, uh, perhaps this year's budget, but it means billions down the road. I think we can. I think we can do without those in this year's budget. With respect to conventional weapons, there you got a mix. I think that we're going for some high cost options that we can stretch out or do without, and then I think that we can uh, turn our emphasis to low cost options like the standoff bomber or the smaller submarine, <coughs> for instance, that would save money down the road. And so I think, in, in that respect, the procurement budget is a potential source of savings. So in these three or four areas, I think, we can say without hurting ourselves. When, when I talk about five to six billion dollars uh, of cuts, it, it, it doesn't hurt us. Now I know that the military will screech to high heaven at that, and that's their business to do. So it's their business to ask, you know, for defense items, it's our business to match that against our other needs. But if I may point out, the inflation alone has eaten up far more than what you're talking about. The, if, you, if you take the cuts that you propose, the Senator uh, is suggesting, and add them to inflation, we are having a real reduction again in our national defense. And that puts this country in a position where, uh, if you continue it very long, and we've been doing it now for five years, you're going to place this nation at some point within the next five to seven years in a position where, as that study showed, we could be subject to a first strike, and I don't think the people of this country, Peoria or anywhere else, want to be put in that position. We simply cannot afford to play any games, take any chances, with our opportunity to preserve and protect and defend this country and to maintain a deterrent posture. And that's, that's the basic question. I just don't believe you can ex ex Senator, exercise Senator, this kind of cut without placing us in jeopardy Senator, at some point. only half of the increase is attributed by Secretary Schlesinger himself to inflation and pay increases. The rest of it is attributable to growth in the budget. Unfortunately, our time has now run out. I'd like to thank our two special experts, Senator Brock of Tennessee and Senator Muskie of Maine, and a special thanks to our panel of experts. Thank you. The debate you have seen featured the conflicting viewpoints of qualified experts in the defense spending field. It's the aim of the American Enterprise Institute to clarify the issues by presenting many opposing thoughts. By so doing, it is hoped that those in decision-making positions will benefit from this free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. This is Peter Hackus in Washington. Washington Debates for the 70s is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C.